Hey, welcome back to Linode. My name is Austin Gill, and this is the second video in a series where we are going to be building full stack applications with Remix, Prisma, and SQL databases. Now that we have a nice lay of the land, we can plow forward with building the application. If we jump over to our terminal, we can start our dev server by running npm run dev. This is going to kick off two commands concurrently. Uh, one is the Tailwind CSS uh, watcher, and the other one is the Remix dev server. Once that's up and running, we can go to our browser and hit uh, localhost port 3000, and we should see a mostly empty page that just says hello world with some little design on the background. Now, this isn't a particularly impressive app to begin with, but we can think of it as nice, rich, fertile soil upon which to build our application. And now that I've got most of my gardening puns out of the way, let's dig in. We'll start by opening up the project in our favorite code editor. Right now I'm using VS Code. And the naming is important because Remix follows the convention of, by default, looking for a folder called app uh, to serve the application from. The other convention that Remix follows that we discussed in the last video was it relies on file system based routing, meaning if we want to create routes, those routes are going to correspond to files in the file system. In this case, those routes are going to live conveniently within the routes folder. So if I want to make any changes to the homepage of this application, I can change the index.jsx file at the root of the routes folder. One of the other things we discussed in the last video was that I have started this project out with some default components and some layouts. So let's go ahead and take advantage of those. I'm going to import the default, oops, default layout from dot dot slash layouts slash default.jsx. And instead of having that H1, we can replace that with the default layout. We see that we have a layout component that includes a header with the little logo and the, the name of the application. And it puts the content inside of this uh, container. Now I'm gonna get rid of that content and I'm actually going to give this a title of pets. So this, what I'm thinking is this homepage is going to be where we show the list of all the pets that we've met and added to our system. I think I have a little problem with, yeah, Remix dev sockets. Okay, if you ever run into this issue, just cause it's come up, uh, sometimes the web sockets fail to connect. So I think I just need to stop and restart the dev server and then that way our uh, automatic reload uh, will trigger so we don't have to manually reload the page. Awesome, so just with a couple of changes, we already have a page that looks a little bit nicer uh, with nice layout and a title. Okay, so on the home page, I know that I'm going to use a grid component, which I have predefined, uh, grid from dot dot slash components slash index dot js. And let's just get familiar with what the grid component works like really quick. So it takes a prop called items, which it expects to be an array of different things. Uh, it could be strings, numbers, could be JSX. So I'll just pass in some strings or some numbers and we can see that those numbers get laid out uh, in a three column grid. We can explore these and we'll see it's an unordered list with some predefined styles and some list items. Cool. Now, uh, that's fine and dandy, uh, but we probably want it to be more like a little bit fancier. We probably don't just want a list of pet names. Maybe we want some card components. So I'm gonna take this array and put that into its own uh, variable. Const, we'll call it pets, equals this array of pets. So we can put that there and replace it. We should see uh, that nothing has changed. Great. And I'm actually going to replace these pets with some objects. Well, actually, 
we'll use one, two, three. Uh, I'm going to map over these pets and put in a different component called a card component. So I've got this card component. Uh, let's see, we're gonna say uh, pets. We're gonna map over each one. This is just plain JavaScript. I'm gonna say each pet is going to uh, return a card component. Uh, the card is also going to expect a couple of things, including a title, which we're going to, yeah, we'll just do the pet for now because those are gonna be numbers. So now if we look, we see uh, three card components with some placeholder is kind of missing there. And we see like the title here. Great, it's got this little hover effect, very nice. So let's make this look a little bit more like realistic data that we're going to be working with. Instead of working with numbers, I'm gonna work with objects and we're gonna have, uh, each pet is going to have a name. So we'll start with Nugget and they're going to have a type at least. So if Nugget is gonna be a type of dog. Okay, cool. And we'll do three of those. We'll do my brother's dog, Thor. And then we'll do Mittens is going to be a cat. Awesome, now because we've changed the contents of this array, uh, pet is no longer a number, it is a, an object with a name. So pet.name can be the title, and then type is going to be uh, pet.type. Cool, let's see how that looks. Much better, uh, we've got some representation of each type of animal they are, as well as their name, very good. So now we have an application that looks kind of good, um, but it doesn't do anything particularly fancy. We're just working within React and doing some layout with some static data. So what we're going to want to do eventually is pull in this data dynamically from a database. And this is where things get a little bit more uh, interesting or unique to Remix. So as I said before, Remix is going to handle the rendering of the page both on the server side and on the client side. And that's a good thing because when it renders on the server side, that is good for SEO, it's good for performance. It means when the user first loads the page, they have all of the page data that they need uh, on that initial load. And then it's also going to handle client side rendering if a user navigates between pages, which is a good user experience because you don't necessarily wanna wait for entire page refresh when you can just have these sections of the page that are gonna change. For example, the header or footer may not change across pages. Now, where that becomes a challenge is that client-side data fetching is slightly different than server-side data fetching in that on the server, we'll probably have access to the database, no problem. On the client, we don't necessarily want to uh, make the database access available. One, because browsers don't necessarily know how to uh, initiate a Postgres protocol request. And two, we definitely don't want our database credentials to exist on the client code. So Remix uh, handles this for us, interesting, with what are called loaders. And these are going to be functions that are used to grab whatever data the component needs, uh, both on the server and the client side, as long, assuming it's not static data. And it's going to provide it differently based on if it's a server request or a client request. So let's look at the code so this actually might make more sense. In here, instead of using uh, static data, which would work fine, uh, we're actually going to make this more ready for dynamic data. So in Remix, there's this concept of loaders. And the way loader works is you have to export a named variable, which is a function called loader. So we can export a uh, function. You could also do const loader equals whatever an arrow function, but I'm gonna say export function loader. And now whatever gets returned by this loader is data that can be made available both on the server render and on the client render. So we're going to just return. Now I'm going to grab this data from our static value, enter it here to be some pseudo dynamic value. And uh, now if we save and reload the page, we should get this error because pets is no longer defined, uh, which we're trying to access here. So how do we get pets? Now you may be thinking we can do const, uh, I'm actually going to, oh, I'm actually gonna change this to an object where we pass in data. Okay. 
And you may be thinking that we can destructure that, grab the data out of that returned object, maybe rename it to the word pets, and uh, assign that to the return value from loader. And this is actually sort of the right concept, but for uh, Remix data loaders, they actually we actually need to use a custom React hook for the client-side render to work correctly. So we're going to import use loader data, and that'll come in. Thanks for the assist on that VS Code. And we get the return value from use loader data, which is that custom hook. That's going to grab the data from the loader that is returned here. And then we're gonna destructure data out of it. We're going to rename it to pets and we should have that available. So if we go to the browser, we can see that we have the same list that we had before. Awesome. And what was the point of all that, right? Uh, we've effectively made our application more complicated by introducing this new loader function and this loader data hook without making it any better because we're still loading the same data. And the answer is that by following this convention, Remix can now uh, take whatever data is returned here and provide it to this component or this route, uh, both on the server render and on the client render. And it gets more interesting when we are working with dynamic data. So for static values, probably not the best approach, but for dynamic data, like a database query, uh, it actually works really well. So we're going to look at adding a database query. Now, if we wanted to, since we're using SQL, if we wanted to query the database, the uh, SQL string would look something like this. Let's do select star uh, from, and then table name. And star is just a, a short uh, keyword for select all of the columns. You could also explicitly say like ID name type or something like that, but I'll stick with star. And this is pretty handy. As I mentioned in the previous video though, uh, sometimes using just plain uh, SQL strings that we write ourselves uh, can be maybe not the most performant way of writing them because uh, you may not be a database expert. Uh, they also can be prone to vulnerabilities like SQL injections and uh, they're not very convenient because you have to kind of switch from languages between JavaScript and SQL. I don't know about you, but that can get kind of tedious for me. So in this project, we are using Prisma to uh, write our SQL for us. It's gonna be the ORM that we uh, we like to use. So let's go ahead and import the Prisma client. So we're gonna import, uh, if you remember, we're getting that out of the services folder. So import db from dot dot slash services slash index.js. And again, this is the, this is just exporting the Prisma client. So we can take a look, where is that services database? There it is, just the Prisma client, and we export it with a little bit of logging so we can see when it makes a query uh, in development mode, we'll actually see what the SQL is that it writes, which is pretty handy. So now, since we're in this loader, we can come down here, we can uh, grab that database, that Prisma client, and if we try to access methods or properties on it, we'll see that we get the auto suggest, which is super handy. Uh, thanks Prisma team for making it nice and well typed so that we get all of this nice IntelliSense. Another cool feature is we can see our pet table here. Now that pet corresponds to any of the tables or any of the models that we include in our Prisma schema. So we can see we have a pet model and that's why we see this pet uh, property on the database that actually is going to correspond to the pet table. Now if we do a dot notation again, we should see some of the methods and properties available on the pet table. And these are the methods that Prisma makes available for us to write queries against the database. Now, because we want to select all of the uh, pets in the pet table, we'll use this method called find many and execute that. And that's pretty much going to return the equivalent uh, query where it's pretty much gonna execute the equivalent query that we wrote above here. Now, really uh, 
really important to understand is that we actually need to use the return value. So we're gonna save that in a variable. We'll say const pets equals whatever the return value of this function is or this method. And we can see that this return value, the type is actually a Prisma promise. So it's almost, it should behave like a regular promise. It has a, a couple advantages of not executing the promise immediately when it's created. It only actually executes the query once you call the dot then method on the promise. But because we're dealing with a promise and we actually want to have the pets, we need to uh, get the resolved value from the promise, not the promise itself. So I'm gonna uh, flag this function as an async function which will allow me to use the await keyword inside of it, which is going to wait for that promise to resolve and assign the result of that promise to the pets, which we can see is an array of pet models. Now that's exactly what we want. That model is going to represent the model that we defined in our schema. So let's take that pets, that list of pets array, replace it with this or replace the static value with this now dynamic value. And if we go back to the home page, we see uh, a more empty page that says nothing to see here. And that's actually a good thing. That's what we want. That means that the database is connected because we haven't added anything to the database. Another cool thing to work that's worth pointing out is when we hit that route, because we have that logging enabled in Prisma, we can go to our terminal and we can see that Prisma query being logged and it's logging this statement. I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy that and come back here and we'll paste it here so we can compare. So this is the SQL that we wanted to generate. This is the SQL that was generated and we can see it's slightly different in comparison, but I'm going to walk through it really quick. We saw the select statement and then we're going to, uh, inside of the public tables, uh, we're getting the pet uh, table and we're getting the ID off of the pet table. So we're selecting the ID and I'm going to go ahead and remove all these because they're a little bit redundant. So now if we get rid of that, we can see that we are selecting the ID property, the name property, the type property, birthday created at and updated at. Now those happen to be all of the columns available on those tables. And when you're selecting all of the columns, you can actually replace that with star. Star is the equivalent of just give me everything on that table. So now this is starting to look a lot, uh, a lot similar. And so we have select star from, and then public.pet, that defines uh, which table we want to use. So that's the table name. So we can actually simplify that to be just pet. And because, you know, in our example, we just put the table name, that would actually be pet. And then the remainder here is just a little bit different. We have where one equals one. This is just a comparison that resolves to true. So uh, it's just going to be where it's true. Uh, that means it's going to select everything anyway. And this offset uh, is going to have a value there, probably zero. We don't need to worry about these now. The only thing I wanted to show off is that uh, although the syntax, the generated syntax is slightly different, the end result is what we were looking for. So get rid of that and leave it as is. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give me a big thumbs up. If you have questions or concerns, go ahead and throw them in the comments below and I'll be sure to get back to you. And please be sure to subscribe to the channel so you can get updated about the next videos that are gonna be coming out where we're going to be handling some of the issues with the homepage and listing content in a more efficient way, as well as deploying. Also, if you are not currently a Linode user and you want to sign up and get some free credits, there's gonna be a link in the description where you can sign up. You'll get $100 in credits used in the next 60 days. And it's a great way to test out some of the cool products that Linode has. And we're actually going to be using Linode to deploy our project. So if you don't have an account, be sure to sign up and we'll be able to do that together.